So um, with um, COVID cases rising with the new variant, what can schools do to keep children safe? Sure. So the approach to keeping children safe is very similar to what we experience in the occupational and environmental medicine uh, specialty, which is keeping workers safe uh, in the workplace. And so uh, with the approaches we've been doing since the beginning of the pandemic, um, which is my specialty in medicine, um, we can likewise first uh, keep kids safe by doing uh, mask wearing, right? Wearing the masks indoors in particular is going to be key to helping prevent transmission of not just COVID, but flu and cold uh, uh, illness as well. Uh, and secondarily, having access to hand, good hand hygiene. So having uh, availability of san uh, sanitizer for children in the uh, classroom and otherwise is going to be key. And hand washing, obviously, is uh, always key as well. Uh, and then uh, obviously with children in particular, it's difficult for social distancing. But if possible, uh, particularly around activities in which uh, you have a high respiratory rate, you're breathing fast, you're active, uh, social distancing uh, to that extent uh, would be prudent. And, and then lastly, um, you know, the approach to vaccination, if appropriate for uh, kids uh, and available to that demographic, that age group, uh, is what we want to promote because we know uh, kids are affected, in particular, more infections with Omicron lately in the younger populations. And we know that, uh, you know, alternatively from vaccination, testing uh, would be key. If the kids are exposed or symptomatic, getting early tested early enough to uh, keep them from preventing spread uh, is going to be essential for uh, the overall picture of keeping kids safe and back to school. Do you recommend, I know my, my children are in private school and mm -hmm. they have implemented a plan to, they tested all the kids before um, school started, before the mm -hmm. winter break came back. And now they're implementing a weekly uh, testing program for all students, which enables band and PE to still continue along with some of the other social activities. Mm -hmm. Is that something that could possibly help public school students as far as reducing the risk of transmission? Absolutely. And we uh, learned that uh, early on in the pandemic from studies that came out of Columbia University looking at prevention of transmission, uh, particularly in the workplace. Again, uh, the uh, setting of schools being very similar to that. Uh, and we saw that testing in that environment does decrease risk of transmission, uh, testing weekly like we're talking about. And uh, the more you test, guess what? The more protection factor uh, we impart to that population, uh, meaning that if we're testing three times a week, which you see in the movie and TV industry, uh, as well as testing daily in some sports uh, act, uh, arenas, right? Um, uh, uh, university sports in particular, testing daily almost. Um, and it's worked to help uh, stem the tide of transmission in those settings. And the, you know, there's obviously been a hotly contested debate mm -hmm. between teachers and uh, our government, our local mm -hmm. government, mm -hmm. as far as what our schools need mm -hmm. and particularly the disparity in um, preventing the spread of COVID in black and brown communities because there is a lack of access to uh, testing, PPE, et cetera, et cetera. What would be your advice, you know, to these communities that are, you know, disproportionately not having the amount of access that other more wealthier uh, school districts have? How do they navigate through this pandemic with limited resources? Sure. There are resources available from municipalities uh, for communities that uh, are classically under-resourced, right? Um, with regard to free masks, uh, cloth masks, and, and free surgical masks. Uh, and the one thing that's free to every American is the vaccination, right? Um, and so we want to promote that because we do still recognize that there is a decrease uh, number proportionally of black and brown vaccinated children and adults in, in the U.S. And and, you know, we, we've been talking about it since the beginning of the pandemic in terms of the perception that the vaccination may be um, something that uh, is not designed to benefit our communities, per se. Right. Um, but we want to reassure uh, our, our black and brown uh, sisters and brothers that it is. It, it definitely is something that uh, is going to benefit uh, not just limiting transmission, but also, and more importantly, perhaps limiting uh, poor outcomes, hospitalizations and deaths. And so we've seen this play out in a positive way uh, when we have instituted uh, 
a uh, emphasis and success of vaccinations in these communities. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of discussion about vaccine hesitancy, particularly mm -hmm. about parents uh, who are concerned, even though we're two years into this, mm -hmm. what you know, the effects of the vaccine, what are the long-term effects, if it's enough research, there are a lot of parents that, that are approaching with the wait and see. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to see how everything goes. What do you say to parents or individuals, period, who still have a certain amount of hesitancy when it comes to the vaccine? What can you tell them sure. to reassure them? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, understandably, some people want to wait and see. Uh, and I would say uh, as both as a physician, as a father of a four year old and a one and a half year old um, and uh, with parents in their uh, mid 70s. Right. Uh, the wait and see period is over. Right. We have um, uh, over a billion people vaccinated. Right. And, and, and globally um, with both the mRNA vaccines and other vaccines like Johnson and Johnson and AstraZeneca. And we know these vaccines are safe and effective at stemming the tide of transmission and preventing, again, poor outcomes like hospitalization and death. And if we look at the disproportionality of how COVID has affected communities, the heart amongst the hardest hit are black and brown communities. And so uh, we have in our power, in our grasp, the the opportunity to reverse this. And the, the pathway to that is through vaccination. And we want to make sure that we partake of the things that we have access to. Um, you know, we oftentimes uh, talk about uh, and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, if I'm being you know, talking about my personal family, complain about lack of access. Right. Um, but when we do have access, if we're not participatory, um, then we're missing a tremendous opportunity to protect ourselves and our loved ones. And that's why we want to still promote uh, ever more so getting vaccinated. You know, one thing parents all know is by October, you have to have your kids vaccination records updated or they will actually mm -hmm. pull your kids out of school. Are mm -hmm. we heading to, you know, where the COVID vaccine is going to be a requirement for, mm -hmm. for our students? It perhaps might be just like we've seen play out in hundreds of universities nationwide. If you're not vaccinated, you're not attending school and you're not able to participate in in-person uh, activities such as extracurricular sports. Uh, and so there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. Uh, if we're heading in that direction, we've been there uh, for several months now uh, at that level, collegiate level. Uh, and I think we'll move in that direction eventually uh, with uh, all schools um, because we know vaccines work uh, and they have been in place for decades decades if we're talking about other illnesses, the measles, mumps, rubella, etc. Um, so uh, we, we will see the hopefully the will of the people play out legislatively so that we can do everything we can to protect our, our school children. You know, and lastly, you know, there's some confusion uh, mm. right now with the CDC as far as guidelines concerning mm. vaccinations, quarantine, what to do if you get mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. COVID. Can you speak to how to cipher through all of the different messages. What what are we supposed to do in the sure. event you are exposed? Sure. Yeah. So I, I try to simplify it for uh, my patients. I try to simplify it for the communities I, I speak with uh, in terms of what is the safest route for the majority. Right. Uh, and so if you are exposed, uh, one, to someone with COVID, a known exposure, right, you begin a quarantine period. And that quarantine period should be uh, uh, sufficient to understand, am I going to get symptoms uh, or a positive test? Right. Uh, uh, so testing at day five, quarantine for five days, test at day five if you can, uh, and you'll know whether you have symptoms at that point. If so, then you continue your isolation for another five days for a total of 10. Uh, if you test positive, same same scenario, you continue your isolation for a 10-day period. Um, and if you at all experience symptoms uh, after an exposure, or if, a, if it's an unknown exposure, you should isolate for 10 days. That's the safest route uh, for all of us, uh, something that I still practice with my friends and family so that uh, we can make sure that we're not transmitting COVID uh, to our loved ones. You know what? I just thought about this. You know, Chicago now has mandates where you cannot go to restaurants, mm -hmm. any public places really without proof of vaccination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that work even in reducing the spread or is it more mm -hmm. about regular testing? There's been a debate as far as mm -hmm. saying, you know what? Vaccinated people can still transmit th this virus. So what is the point of these mandates? Is it mm -hmm. more about testing 
Mm -hmm. So it's a twofold approach. Um, uh, each one is not sufficient on its own, right? Um, if we said vaccination only is the way out of this, uh, we wouldn't uh, reach the other side of this anytime soon, right? Uh, because you're right, transmissions can still happen. If we said only testing is what's going to get us out of this, uh, again, we still would have susceptible pools of individuals um, and have severe outcomes and death uh, at an increased uh, amount uh, than what we've seen play out without COVID, right? And so um, we, it's it's a combination of both uh, vaccination and testing that will move us towards decreased transmissions through testing often and uh, decreased uh, poor outcomes health-wise. And that all moves us towards a more endemic experience with COVID versus pandemic, meaning it becomes more like the flu uh, than it does uh, the uh, tremendous burden it has been uh, for, for this uh, two-year period. So that's the uh, uh, overall uh, goal. Uh, and to get there, we need both. I was gonna ask, uh, what are there specific uh, things that we are that are that the world needs to get it to the space, space where it's an endemic? Uh, yes, we're going to we're going to need, um, you know, a global immunity to an extent. Right. Uh, if you look at what WHO has said, uh, what our CDC leadership has said, what physicians and clinicians are saying, it's not until we reach a global, uh, quote unquote, herd immunity. I know that word has a lot of um, misnomer and connotation to it. But at the end of the day, we need to have enough people globally that aren't susceptible to a tremendous burden of COVID. Um, and that susceptibility is what's breeding the new variants, what's breeding uh, the continual transmission. And once we get to a point where uh, individuals aren't as susceptible, gl susceptible globally, and we have the uh, uh, kind of stemming of the tide of new emerging um, variants that present new risks to us all, uh, then we'll start to move towards a more endemic picture uh, as a society. So the more people are vaccinated, does that reduce the, the mm -hmm. chances of this virus mutating into these different variants? Is that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. I did not know that. So. You bet. You bet. <laughs> well, I appreciate you talking to me. Is there anything else you want our Chicago Defender readers to know about how to protect themselves and how to stay safe? Um, no, this is perfect. I think we covered all the uh, salient uh, points. And if we all mask, we'll get to the other side of this very, very much sooner. Right. So I'm glad we have a mask mandate um, in place now, but we all need to still rally and, and do our part uh, as we you know, individually experience our, our go through the course of our lives and our day. Yeah, well, um, uh, our, my company, HFIT, will be pitching to CPS uh, a testing program that uh, we're doing with uh, large companies and universities. So hopefully uh, we'll find together a path forward for sure. That would be awesome. That yeah. would be really awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. In the you show. bet. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Pleasure to meet you, Danielle. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye.